Welcome to the She Wins Podcast. I am your host, Heather Sumlin, and today I have the amazing Tia Anders. I met Tia back in 2013 when she became a mental management certified coach with my father's company, Mental Management Systems. So I have been a fast friend of hers ever since, but I learned some new things in our podcast today. I learned that she struggled more than I had known. So we're not just going to talk about dog sports, we're going to talk about life. And we're going to talk about solutions that she learned along the way, some of her aha moments. And um, what does winning mean to Tia? Join us. Well, Tia, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. So tell everybody a little bit about you. Well, I've uh, been in dog sports for 23 years now. And I started a dog training business in uh, the Central Coast of California in 1999. And I just sold that business uh, in 2021. And now I do my very favorite sport, which is I teach nose work for the company that I sold. And I'm a certifying official and a judge for NACSW. And I'm a mental management coach. So I have a lot of fun. I love it. And I love that you're a mental management coach because that's how I met you back in 2013 when you came down and got certified with mental management with my father, Lanny Basham. So incredibly cool. So one of the things that I like to do with this particular podcast is ask a couple of similar questions to every guest. And then one of them is, how do you define winning? Well, for me, I define winning. I am a goal setter. I like to set goals. It helps me. So I define winning really as having accomplished, in my mind, my goals. And I don't even always put a timeline on them. I've had a lot of goals in my life, things I wanted to to do. And just going after it and the whole journey that goes with it is a huge part of winning. So it's not just the end game, what I get when I get there. It's everything that I learned along the way. And I think about that a lot because to me, that really is the part that brings me huge joy. And I feel like I did it. I did it. I did it. You know, so I, that's winning. It, it's about accomplishing a goal. And sometimes goals have to be shifted a mm-hmm. little bit. And it's, you know, makes a lot of sense to shift goals at times. Although for me, when I look back on what were my big wins in my life, that's what it is. It's setting goals and making it happen. And sometimes I feel like the wins happen along the way to what you thought that end result was going to be. And then the the little aha moments that happen along the way make the winning even so much more valuable. They do. They do. It's just, it's, it's so exciting. I think back a lot on when I finally got to go work on my master's degree on something I was really interested in, which was natural resources, but it had a lot of environmental work involved. And I had so many cool experiences during, because part of it was very experiential. So I had so many cool experiences during that, um, that journey to get the master's degree. And when I look back on them, I just always feel really happy that I had that opportunity to do it in that way. So let's talk a little bit. Let's start with a defining moment in your life. And I know when we talked earlier, you have several. So what is one that we can kind of start with? What is one defining moment? Maybe your life is full of them. a defining moment, although the one I'm going to pick, because it was so huge for me, when I look back over my entire life, which has been quite a while now, um, in my 20s, I was married to... uh, a a really wild and crazy guy. (laughs) And um, we had a wild and crazy time in our 20s. And when we, the weekend that we broke up, um, my ex-husband was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And my mom was an alcoholic. And I had a lot of alcoholics in my life growing up. And I really realized at the time that I wanted to change my lifestyle. I wanted to go for a healthy lifestyle. So when I was in my late 20s, I made the choice to totally give up alcohol and give up pot. (laughs) Wasn't even legal then. And it was 
just such a huge change in my life. You know, I'm not saying it was 100% easy. Although when I look back, making that decision at that time in my life, just looking down the road of what people I knew and loved had gone through in a state of being um, addicted to alcohol or other things, I just realized, I remember thinking, wow, I don't ever want to go down that road. Like, I don't want that to even be a part of my life. And within um, about six to nine months, I was doing my best to remember after that, I had totally changed my lifestyle. I'd become a vegetarian, taken up yoga and meditation. And I didn't like choose to be a vegetarian. I just was, you know, it's just I realized, wow, I don't, I don't eat meat anymore. I don't want to. And I got a new job. I finished my undergrad degree. Um, I sold, we sold the house that we lived in together and I bought a new house. And within like six months to nine months, my life was totally different. And it was awesome. And the power that came with that, making a choice of moving away from something that wasn't working for me into something that I really had a lot of hope and faith would work well for me. And it did. It was it was great. So what would your advice be to someone who is stuck in their circumstances? And they whether their circumstances are an unhealthy relationship or an addiction or a job they don't they know is not the right fit, what's your advice? My advice would be just begin today moving towards what is really going to work for you in your life. A lot of times when we're stuck in those circumstances, we see all the reasons why we can't make those changes, why it would be too difficult. And yet I think just taking one step each day towards what you want to do and focusing on moving through life towards your joy, your happiness is, you know, it's worth everything really. I love that point too, like making that one one step forward each and every day instead of staying stuck. And it doesn't have to be big steps. It can be mm -mm. baby steps, no, but really at least doesn't. you're moving really forward. Doesn't. So I'm curious, um, one of the things, because we I call this podcast She Wins Solutions and Stories. So our goal is to tell short stories, but then also kind of shed light on some solutions. And I and I know when we talked the other day, there was a time when you had to create a creative solution to a problem. Can you tell more about that? Well, there's been several, really. And I think the first one that really made me realize that if something wasn't working for me, I could choose to change it. And there's quite a few that come to mind. Um, one I think just because it has more to do with my current career dog training. Uh, when I made the move from Arizona to California, we moved to a smaller, more rural community. And I remember um, for the very first time in my life, I decided to take some time off work. I've been working since, you know, I was quite young and I'd never taken a break. So I took a break and I wanted to take some time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. Because when I moved here from Arizona, the only environmental jobs I could find were sitting behind a computer writing EISs, and I just didn't want to do that. So I remember being out on the beach and walking along and seeing all these people with their dogs, and they were screaming and yelling and yanking and choking and, you know, all the things people do when they just don't know how to communicate with a dog. And as I began to notice this area when I moved here was like, they didn't have any clicker training. They didn't have any positive dog training. It was pretty much all the old school, more force-based. So um, the solution I came up with is to become a dog trainer. So I spent some time training. I had already worked with dogs for a long time in my personal life. And um, I began my dog training facility. And when I started, I was the only uh, officially positive training area in town. I had one friend who I met and we're now best friends and have been for 25 years. 
who taught positive puppy classes, but she never, she didn't teach beyond puppy. So I created a dog training facility. I bought my own, I, you know, I built my own center. And before long, thousands of people were being trained with positive dog training. So it was awesome. I just saw something that wasn't working here. And it just happened to fit with what would be a wonderful new career for me. Let me follow my passion. I feel like you were open to that mm -hmm. change. You were looking for something to do. And then here, a walk on the beach. Yeah. And you're like, wait, yeah. I can help that person. And I can help that person. And I can help that dog. <laughs> exactly. And my goal for my company was always to um, help people to live a happier life with their dogs and their dogs to live a happier life with their people. That's what I was always working towards. And it was very fulfilling. So how did you get started in the positive dog training initially, even just for yourself? Well, I actually had learned it in my 30s. The very first time I got a little dog, I'd always had large dogs in my life, and I got this little tiny Lasso Opso. And I, I sat back to start training in the same way I'd always done it in the past. And I thought, you know, I just can't do that. I can't put a collar you know, choke collar on this dog and yank her around. She's this little thing. So I actually contacted someone in my area in Arizona, and he was um, a mover and a shaker in the beginnings of clicker training in the field. And he actually taught me to clicker train. And then I taught all my animals from there on out and many other people's friends. You know, I helped friends to teach their dogs. So that got me started. So once I learned it, I thought, well, why would anyone ever want to do it the other way? And I realized that people just didn't know. People hadn't been hadn't been educated. So is that your book right behind you that you wrote? It is. That is my book. Let's see. I never know which way to turn yeah. when I'm doing <laughs> Zoom. Yeah, I, I wrote a book called Click and Connect, um, Training Your Dog a Lifelong Journey. And it was really a it, it was a manual for people who took my class. It was available to the public, but mostly I sold it um, over the 21 years. I had my business as kind of like a handbook people could take with the class. They wouldn't have to take notes. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's hard to take notes when you're handling an 80-pound yeah. dog jumping around or a little puppy. Oh, well, and I'm I'm aware of the 80 pound dog now that <laughs> the the dog living it. the dog that Ashley brought home in June without warning. Um, well, there's one she brought home in December without warning, and then there's the one she brought home in June without warning. And you would think she would have learned not to do that after December. We have learned now. We are not yeah, taking any more so dogs. Funny. <laughs> well, it's good you can stop there. I've had yeah. six dogs most of my life. I'm down to three for the first time in. Ever. <laughs> well, in about 40 years. So. <laughs> we had three. Well, when I met my husband, he had three St. Bernards. Oh, my God. And so talk about very large dogs. So we're, That takes up a lot of room. Uh-huh. And we're not opposed to a large dog, thank goodness, because this puppy she brought home in June is now, I mean, the last time we weighed him, he was 61 pounds, and that was a few weeks ago. And he's grown quite significantly <laughs> since then. And so I don't know how big he's going to get. I know. You're working on it. I know. But he's he's a really good boy. So thank goodness. And he's super That's sweet. Awesome. So we'll see. We'll, we'll check in in another six months. We'll see how big is he. We'll find out. All right. So I, I want to know a little bit more about your experiences with mental management. What is your favorite thing that you get to teach? Well, for me, um, I've really focused. So... I, I came to mental management through my own beginnings of learning competition. I just, I hadn't been competitive as a child, like many people had competed in things when they were kids, and I didn't really do that. So when I got into dog sports, I deliberately did my best to avoid them for a while. I wasn't really interested in, you know, formal obedience and some of those things. And then I discovered musical canine freestyle of all things with my little pug and I decided to go ahead and compete so those were my very first ex experience and that's when I first was introduced to mental management through a gal named Chris Hurley mm -hmm. who came and did a seminar in California about 
various freestyle things. And I read the books and I learned some of it. And then when I started nose work in 2008, I realized how different this sport was from other sports because, of course, all the searches are blind and you don't know what's exactly what's going to be happening. So um, that's when I went to Lanny in 2013 and trained with him and decided, you know, I was in your first certified coaches program. So for me, what it really is, it's about making the competitive journey really joyful mm -hmm. because I was I was an inconsistent competitor before mental management before I really knew how to apply it I I felt good some days and other days I just didn't feel good and usually <laughs> I performed right along those lines so it, for me it's given me a lot of joy and a lot a lot more confidence to have the mental management when I compete myself, which is what I, I started it for, because I thought, wow, I'm not having that much fun. And then once I did that, I really wanted to share that with others who were competing and help as many people as I could to have a consistent, you know, journey of, of really being in a place where they're focused and feel like they're doing their best and have confidence. So, you know, it, it really knows work it, is what got me to delve into it big time. For people who are watching or listening and have no clue what nose work is or what canine freestyle is, really quick, <laughs> explain. Well, um, nose work is a detection style sport where we set hides like it's it's similar to what a narcotic dog would do, only we've got no narcotics. They search for birch, anise, and clove, and we put little Q-tips with drops of oil on them in little tubes and hide those around. So you enter a room, you ask your dog to search, the dog finds the odor and alerts the handler. And of course, it's ended up being a very popular sport. So it's it's really fun because the dogs instinctually love to use their noses and we get to handle them and support them in that journey. Um, musical canine freestyle is a performance put to a, a music and it's usually made up of quite a few tricks and behaviors that you do with your dog. So people call it dancing with your dog because it's put to music. It, it's really quite an advanced dog sport because you have to do quite a few behaviors in a short period of time and you need to make it all flow with the music, which adds an extra level of difficulty. So um, it's tons of fun, but it's 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 more difficult than you would think. I'm very impressed when I see people do a really good job with it. I think it makes it makes it look easy. Like when they make it look easy, that's when you're you're like, wow, I bet I could do that with my dog. And then I, I realize know. I always think when people used to roll their eyes, oh, what a silly sport. I thought, well, you you see if you can do forty behaviors with a dog with no reinforcement in three minutes and keep tuned to music. <laughs> That's it's right. It's not as easy as you think. It's I I don't think it's easy at all. I'm not, I don't think it's easy at all. And I think it's really fun. It's different because there's so many unknowns. You know, the handler doesn't know where the odor is, the, the everything. It's a dog-driven sport rather than a handler-driven sport. So we have to depend on our dogs to know what they're doing and hopefully we've we've taught them. We've laid the foundation so that they are are comfortable out there. So based on all of the things that you've been through, um, your vast experience in life, what is one piece of advice that you've been given that you think has made the biggest impact on you? Overall and everything, it would have to be, um, I had a good friend, she's passed now. Um, one of the things she always said is when you have decision to make, when you're looking at how to move forward, do what serves love mm. all the way around. And when you look at things that way, when you ask yourself, when you have a decision to make, um, what serves love here? It helps me to be able to make a decision, not necessarily the easy decision, a decision that will bring most benefit to all involved. Sometimes it's the harder thing to do, quite frankly. In the end, though, um, it brings more joy and happiness to people. I love that. I love that idea. What serves love? Yeah, it's a good. It's a good question to ask yourself when you have something you have to do, and you think, "I really want to do this. Maybe I should do this." It's like, well, 
Sometimes there's a gift you can afford to give to someone mm -hmm. who needs it. And uh, in terms of trust or forgiveness or whatever that might be. And sometimes it's time to, uh, you know, get a little space and move in another direction. So you just have to look at what's what's good for the whole. I like that too, because I think sometimes we make decisions either based on what's only good for us, or sometimes we'll stay in a situation because it's good for someone else, but it's not good for us. And right. so when you're just kind of blanketly saying what serves love as a whole, then you have to take yourself into account. You have to take others into account. That's, that's right. It's a really deep way. It's a very simple statement and a very deep meaning. Yeah, it so really is. That's an that's an exciting way to look at to look at life. <laughs> Has there ever been a time when you maybe you didn't really win, but you learned a significant lesson? <laughs> oh, so many. Which shall I pick? <laughs> I you know, know, for me that happens. Um, you know, it happens. I have something I want to do. I can think in terms of even um, just competing at a nose work trial. Every time I go out, you know, often, ideally, you want to get as many points as you can out there at the lower level. You have to really um, find each of the hides correctly. And whenever it hasn't worked for me, when I haven't gotten it, I've always learned something like, wow, my, I, my dog needs to work more on trapping odor, or I really need to realize now that my almost 13 year old dog has slowed down a lot. And I have to find the easy hides first and then come back to the hard ones and give her as much time as we have left to work it out. So whenever it doesn't work for me in terms of at the end of the day, did I qualify? Did I get a title? Did I place or get a ribbon? It's always a win because I can figure out, wow, look at what I learned. And then I get to use that the next time. So, so what's next for you? What's coming up? Well, next week, <laughs> I'm in two trials. I've, I've got my older dog, Shammy, an elite nose work trial. And uh, Reacher is in a baby dog trial in NW2. And so next week, I've got two trials coming up. And I'm also hosting a day of host for a trial. And I use um, mental management a lot when I'm a certifying official or a host or a judge. Because there are things that come up and you still need to clear your mind and focus on what's happening in the now moment. I'm excited. The outcome. I'm excited, too, about some work that you and Barbara and I are going to be doing together. I'm, I'm excited. Well, that's next week also, isn't it? Oh, my it, gosh. Everything's next week. <laughs> of course, this might this might actually air after this all happens. But the what we've decided to do, which I think is so exciting, is bring, because we're all certified coaches, is come together and do some things together. And so we're working on a Patreon channel together, which you and I will record a Patreon episode for dog handlers. We'll also record a Patreon episode for women. So we're going to have two separate episodes that we're going to record today based on some of your knowledge and experience, which will be so exciting. And so we're doing that together. It's so fun for me. Um, you and I are going to do a nose work, kind of a it's not called mental mastery. What what did they call the title? Peak, um, peak performance or something for nose work? <laughs> now um, I can't remember. Do we need to oh look it up, Robas? It just went out of my head. Mindful training for peak performance ah, is what we that's call That's it. it. Mindful training for peak performance. Yes. Yeah. And that's yes. in starts in January, which is going to be open for people to be able to purchase soon and join us for that. Since there's a webinar series, which I'm super excited to join you on. And yeah, that's very exciting. I think that's going to be fun to have it geared specifically to nose work handlers. I, I I'm, do too. I'm excited. Too. I'm so excited <laughs> about that. One underlining theme that I hear from you this whole time is number one, you need to be happy with what you're doing, like joyful through the journey. And so I have a couple of different questions for you. Okay, so okay. first of all, the, the first defining moment that you mentioned was really changing your habits and making sure that you were choosing to be healthy and getting rid of the negative habits that you had fallen into in your 20s. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself in your 20s, at what point would you have a conversation and what would you tell yourself? 
Wow, that's a big question. Honestly, um, I came to a conclusion. I remember when I turned 26, I decided, hmm, this partying needs to stop. I need to get serious about things. I was very functioning. I mean, I held a full-time job and I went to night school. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a degree during that time or finished my degree shortly after. Uh, what I would tell myself now is why wait? Mm. So I was 26 when that happened and it was another couple years until I actually made the move out of um, that marriage and really into a healthy lifestyle, both <laughs> physically and psychologically. So my question would be, why wait? What's the waiting for? <laughs> Yeah, why why wait? Start now. If you can make a yeah. decision that's going to make you happier, healthier, and overall mo more joyful, why not do it today? Right, exactly. So another question that I have is what is the one thing that that experience taught you that you still carry on today? That experience taught me to trust my knowing mm -hmm. because I had that knowing about what was in my highest good like I talked about before, really what would serve love for all involved. And it took me a while to come around to making the decision to do it. So really trusting my knowing, my gut feeling um, has served me very well in my life. Were there mentors that you had to lean on during this time? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, one of my mentors, um, my, my dear friend Cinnamon, who's passed, um, she's someone I met right about, right prior to making those changes in my life. And we were best buddies up until she passed in 2018. But she was a person who dedicated her life to helping people. She was a spiritual teacher, for lack of another term. And she that was her only purpose in life, was to help people. And so she was one of my major mentors during that time. And then also, I found that the people we surround ourselves with, people who are positive, people who are hopeful, people that, you know, believe that there's good in the world and good in people, uh, can help us to move forward in that way. And I, I did a lot of that when I made those changes in my life. It wasn't like I said, you know, see it to everybody I knew. What I found is that I didn't have much in common with that particular group in my life anymore. So I ended up moving on to a lot of really close and wonderful friends where, you know, our our weekends were spent hiking, you know. Oh, that and sounds like it, so much it more was fun. Loads of fun. That sounds like so much more fun to me than Oh, it was so much more fun. <laughs> oh, I like it when you can remember what happened. The next day. Me too. I was going to say it was not just fun, but I could remember the whole weekend. I could you know, remember. It was awesome. You know, there was a time where it seemed like you, you don't really realize till you let go of things that your life can revolve around, you know, partying or a certain lifestyle that's been established. And then when you break free of that, it's like, wait a minute, there's so much more, you know, all this other stuff that's really, really exciting to do. So. You were missing so much opportunity because you were having yes, too much fun. we have no idea we're even missing. Absolutely. Know? It's so much more fun to remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> and to be Absolutely. able, because you can relive it over and over again, and you can talk about it, and you can share it, and it's so incredibly exciting. So lesson number one, make sure you remember yesterday so that you can... <laughs> So that you can share it again and again and again. <laughs> I, I also real I love getting to talk to you because I always feel like I learn something and get a level deeper and get to understand you even better. And we work so well together. I would just I respect you and I value you as a coach and I'm excited for what we have coming forward in the future. And I'm I'm so incredibly excited. Okay, if Thank you're you, me too. If you are not a Patreon member, I highly recommend that you all join my Patreon membership because T and I are going to do a deep dive into some of her advice for women. Maybe we'll talk about relationships. Maybe we'll talk about overcoming those healthy habits. Maybe we'll talk about something else that's a little bit even more interesting. And we're going to talk to dog handlers about ways that you can apply mental management to your life. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Tia. Y'all have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.